Mr. Young is a member of Anthony, Anthony Rogers Chambers. He's both a practicing barrister and a professional civil engineer. He has considerable experience in preparation of contract documentation and in contract administration and handling claims by contractors in infrastructure, highways, and earthworks projects. Mr. Young has acted as a sole arbitrator and co-arbitrator in many construction and commercial disputes. He is listed in the HKIAC panel of arbitrators, the Bar Association panel of arbitrators, and the Hong Kong IE panel of arbitrators. He has also been appointed by ICC as co-arbitrator in an international commercial arbitration involving a sum of about 17 million US dollars. And the topic that Mr. Young will share with us today is third-party funding arbitration in the construction industry. Mr. Young, please. Thank you. Um, you can see from the topic that uh, I'm going to talk about your so-called third-party funding arbitration. And in fact, um, when I prepared this topic, uh, I've asked myself uh, uh, this sort of question. First of all, what, what is third-party funding arbitration? And uh, secondly, uh, why do we need to have third-party funding arbitration? And um, third is how would this third-party funding arbitration be implemented in Hong Kong and to enable this process to be done in Hong Kong? And next is um, uh, who can be third-party funding? Uh, and um, last is how would ensure that this third-party funding be implemented effectively in Hong Kong? And those are the questions uh, which um, we are going to look at um, uh, this afternoon about third-party funding arbitration. Now, in fact, this topic had um, been a hot topic about, um, uh, in fact, in the last decade because uh, uh, of a number of cases uh, which we are going to discuss. And in fact, um, 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 third-party funding arbitration has become common in, the, in other um, countries, say, like the Europe, uh, I uh, say like the UK, US, etc. But in Hong Kong, that was only um, uh, developed in the last decade. And in fact, um, just look at the other competing jurisdictions, just like Singapore. Uh, they also had this reform only recently, uh, in 2017 and uh, also in 2021. So you can see um, this development is rather recent. And so that is why I think um, uh, uh, some of you may be interested in this, so that is why I pick up this topic for a discussion. And um, first of all, we, we look at the first questions uh, uh, to understand is what do we mean by third party funding? So obviously third party funding means someone who is third party to the dispute. They fund the um, litigation process or arbitration. So this is what we call third-party funding. So, um, so you can see that, that we, we treat, usually people treat it as a business. So that is why we have the commercial investor and they would like to take a share of the process. And, um, and, and this third-party provides funds, usually in the, in the way of course, a legal course um, um, to the party so that uh, they could uh, have the proceedings be proceed. So the, of, of course, there would be return for this investor. And the return is that uh, if the proceedings are, are successful, the third party funder will receive a share of the recoveries. But on the other hand, they will also bear risk. The risk is that uh, if the funding, uh, if the proceeding is unsuccessful, the, fund, the funder party would not be required to pay and all the fees, et cetera, legal costs, et cetera, would be borne by the investor. So, so that would be the so-called the allocation of risk and the profit. Now, um, with, with this in mind, we, we look at uh, some other, some, some, some uh, statistical figures. So obviously, um, for this sort of share, uh, we, we look at the UK experience. Um, usually under, un, under um, this sharing ratio, um, of course, depending on the uh, winning chance of the case itself. Of course, also depending on how much legal cost or how much money would be able to be recovered from the, uh, from the, um, from, from the um, dispute resolution process. And also on the, um, the likely sharing ratio. 
So in, in just some figures for you to consider is that in the in UK, uh, th those cases which would uh, attract investors' attention are those cases uh, usually have a chance of success of around 60% to 70%. And um, the amount at stake would um, usually be required to exceed 1 million Hong Kong dollars. So that is around 100,000 a pound in the UK. And of course, the larger amount, the larger amount involved, the greater will be the attractiveness of this to investors. About the sharing ratio, and it's, it ranges, it ranges from 15% to 50%. So the median is 33%. But uh, you can see those are the um, sharing ratio we, which we are talking about. So if the amount involved is large, obviously you would expect it that the sharing ratio would be lower. But of course, if the, the amount involved is a small sum, usually the, the um, sharing ratio would be higher towards the, the investor. Okay, so th those are the backgrounds uh, behind for third party funding. Now, uh, next is that um, um, uh, why do people need to have third party funding? Usually, they are those people who do not have sufficient means to finance the, um, the, the dispute resolution process. Now, in Hong Kong, the legal costs are, well, some, some people are talking about astronomical figure, but, but uh, of course, we are, that is uh, some sort of like exaggerated. But, but we all know that uh, it is very expensive to engage lawyers. So um, uh, you, you won't expect that uh, uh, a commercial cases could be, um, uh, uh, the, the fees involved will usually be in the order of a few millions. So, and uh, sometimes, depending on the complexity of case, it may even check up to about uh, uh, more than 10 million and even more. So, you could uh, imagine that uh, this sort of uh, uh, legal cause we are, we are facing. So, that is why people, tr uh, for those people who do not have sufficient financial means, or even they have sufficient financial means, they are thinking of some other more interested topic more interested subject for them to invest. So against two uh, back, uh, possibilities that uh, people are thinking of diversifying their risk to get somebody, in this case the third party, to invest in their um, potential uh, dispute resolution process. So that is why third party funding becomes heated topic. Now next is we look at the attractiveness and problems being faced. Now of course the attractiveness is, is that uh, if we have um, this sort of third party fund arbitrations being done in Hong Kong, that will bring, uh, well that will first of all promote the Hong Kong's um, reputation as an arbitration center. And second is they are uh, associated profession which can benefit from the increased number of arbitration cases in Hong Kong. So that is why um, Hong Kong um, sees that that's a business opportunity, and that is why uh, uh, Hong Kong is trying to um, uh, use this as a mean to um, to promote uh, third party fund arbitration in Hong Kong. But there is one big problem being faced in Hong Kong is that the common law still regards the maintenance and charity as an offence. Not just an offense, it is also a civil tort. So in both regards, it is a civil and criminal wrong. Now, it is against this um, difficulty that um, uh, people are trying to look at how this problem can be resolved. And um, that is what um, the maintenance and charity uh, is defined uh, under common law. First of all, as I said, they are civil and criminal wrongs. And, uh, and before the amendment of the, um, the uh, third party funding amendment ordinance, they are regarded as uh, a, a, a being applied to arbitration proceedings. And I give you a definition of maintenance, which is directed against wanton and officious intermeddling with the disputes of others, in which the defendant has no interest whatever and whether the assistance he renders to be the one or other party is without certification or cause. So this is the definition of maintenance. 
Transferability is um, also a form of maintenance, but uh, the difference is that uh, there is a sharing of a portion of the um, amount in dispute. So you can see that, that maintenance is a wider and transferability is slightly narrower in that uh, you have a, a, some sort of sharing. And uh, under common law, it, provi it is provided under section 10, uh, uh, sorry, section 101I of the criminal procedure ordinance, talking about it, that uh, it will be a, a imprisonment of seven years. So you will see, you, you, will, you will see that, that uh, this is a very serious offense. So that is the uh, problem being encountered. And of course, common law is still applicable in Hong Kong under the, um, the basic law. So, um, so um, that is something uh, which really troubles the petitioners and also the investors. And uh, I draw a timeline as to the relevant uh, cases which I'm going to talk, and uh, essentially there, there are two cases which concerns about the uh, transferability and maintenance. And the first one is Unruh uh, 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 and uh, Seaburger. And uh, this was uh, decided in 2007, and then uh, followed by another case of Winnie Lowe and, um, and uh, Hong Kong government. And these are the two landmark cases about the maintenance and transferability. And you can see subsequently there are development uh, by the Law Reform Committee and with the legislation being enacted and core practice being produced by the Department of Justice to enable this be done in Hong Kong. And we first look at the case, which is a landmark case decided by Court of Final Appeal, and you can see that was decided in 2007. So that was about 15 years ago. And the facts of this case is talking about uh, uh, two individual persons. And uh, Seaburger is an investor, and uh, he, he wished to buy a company owned by uh, an, Anru, uh, Mr. Anru. And uh, before the date of completion, uh, there was an arbitration between the company and, and, and the uh, famous group of Benetton. In fact, Benetton and Boulevard, they are talking about watch, watch selling business. And um, um, the, the case of arbitration is in Netherlands. So, um, so the case of arbitration is not in Hong Kong. And um, um, on 19th of September 1992, uh, these two gentlemen entered into a memorandum of agreement talk about the sharing of the uh, compensation. And uh, 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 Mr. Anru is obliged to provide endeavors to um, Mr. Seberger and in return uh, for any money he received in excess of um, uh, 10,000, uh, in, in excess of 10 million, um, the, uh, he would get a, a bonus of 10% of any amount in, in excess of this. The case, the arbitration case was settled after the acquisition and uh, Mr. Seberger refused to pay Mr. Anru the special bonus and that is why the case has been taken to court. Now, um, the argument on this is whether the, the um, special bonus agreement is transferred, whether uh, this is a sharing of the process of the, of the litigation result in this case, it is the arbitration result. Okay, um, so you can see from this timeline that, that uh, um, uh, I've set out the license agreement, set out uh, how the, um, uh, uh, the arbitration com was commenced, and then uh, uh, all the relevant matters have been um, stated here. So I don't think we need to go to details, um, but the issue is, is about uh, the enforceability of the memorandum of agreement whether that is um, transferred and contrary to public policy. That was the issue before the court. And then um, in this case, the CFA held that, first of all, the doctrine of maintenance and transferability continue to have effect in Hong Kong. And um, the court also identified three categories where liability for en engaging in maintenance of transferability could be excluded. Uh, these are the uh, famous three exclusion category. The first one is common interest category. That means those persons who have a legit legitimate interest in the outcome of the litigation 
are justified in supporting the litigation. Now, this is the typical example. For example, you have the controlling shareholder who finance the cause of litigation or arbitration by a firm, sorry, by a company, right? So this is the typical example of common interest category. Number two is cases involving access to justice consideration. So if you are having a rich man who see that there is a poor man who have a good case and he wish to provide finance for him to fight for his benefit, so that would fall within the access to justice consideration. So that, that, that you may say that's um, within um, the, the moral standard. Uh, you may say that's common sense, but anyway, that, that's the um, case talking about uh, uh, second category. And the last one is a miscellaneous category of practices accepted as lawful, such as the sale and assignment <coughs> by a trustee in bankruptcy of an action commenced in bankruptcy to a purchaser for value. So that's the typical case of insolvent company or bankrupt person who has a good case and then the uh, official receiver when the, uh, the person is declared bankrupt or uh, the company declared liquidated, he's, he, uh, the liquidator sells the, um, uh, the case, the, 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 the whole case to uh, an investor. So that is also common in Hong Kong and that is regarded as lawful. So now these are the three categories which uh, the law, the common law recognize to be an exception to the doctrines of maintenance and charity. Now in construction industry, we, we all know that um, in the case of NSC, non subcontractor, they, when they wish to recover their money, the problem which they usually face is that uh, the contract is between the NSC and the main contractor. So they do not have a privity of contract between the NSC and the employer, right? So in this case, how could the subcontractor do? Of course they could sue the main contractor, but the main contractor will usually say that, that I do not have money. I have not received the money from the employer. So in fact, uh, there is a pay and pay cost. So against this basis, I am not obliged to pay you, right? Now, so in order to avoid this argument, in Hong Kong, we also have the so-called name borrowing provision. That means the NSC would have a chance, in fact an option, for using the main contractor's name to sue the employer for the amount of work done by the NSC, which is also part of the uh, main, main contract works. Right? Now, so this is a typical uh, situation and quite commonly occurring situation in Hong Kong. This is not regarded as against Tramfety, even though the case is run by the subcontractor using the main contractor's name, right? So this, you may say, fall within the third category, third, sorry, the third category of three, but sometimes if you are using legalistic analysis, it doesn't fall within the chemistry arrangement, right? So, um, so that is essentially what's been said by the, the case of Anru and Seaburger. And then some, um, um, the CFA, the, the CFA has expressly left open the question whether maintenance and charity applied in agreements concerning arbitration sticking in place in Hong Kong, as it did not arise in, in, in that case. Now, um, it's been set out in paragraph 118 of the judgment saying that uh, uh, it's common ground that the doctrines of maintenance and charity are unknown to Netherlands law. So it is, in other words, not against Netherlands public policy for a third, part, third person to provide assistance to support a case, so to support to a party in to a arbitration or to legal proceedings in that jurisdiction, whether or not for a share in the process. Now, assuming for the purposes of this argument that the, the MOA would, as a matter of pure domestic law, be regarded as tremendous, should the court refuse to enforce it, being a contract made in Hong Kong and subject to Hong Kong law on the ground that is tremendous, notwithstanding the absence of objection under Netherlands law. So now that was um, uh, a CFA's um, um, opinion. And then uh, the CFA held that uh, it should not strike down any agreement providing the third party funding of arbitration on the ground of maintenance of charity 
where such fund arbitral proceedings are seated in a jurisdiction in which there's no public policy objection to such funding. Now, so that's the, that's the um, dicta of CFA. Now, so I find this logic. So if you are talking about a third party funding uh, arbitration, for example, in the United States, for example, in UK, for example, in uh, most European countries, say like uh, France or Germany, would this agreement be struck down? The answer by CFA is no, right? So you would be able uh, to, to, to hold that such an arbitration, such an agreement is not chamfered, right? So that is essential. But as far as Hong Kong, CFA has deliberately reserved its position. It, it said because this case does not arise, does not have this problem of arbitration in Hong Kong, so they, CFA refused to give any dicta or any ruling on this matter. So that is why, that is why the matter needs to be uh, discussed in topic and the uh, Law Reform Committee uh, was set up uh, to deal with this topic. Okay, so it is against this background that um, uh, we have a further discussion about this. Right, now, um, Okay, now the next case which we are going to is a, of course a criminal case and we need all is the solicitor handling a personal injury case. And in this case, um, um, the, um, the court uh, discovered that uh, uh, Ms. Lowe, when, uh, when she was acting as the solicitor of the victim, uh, when the victim bought an action against the driver of vehicle, uh, um, in which the son was a passenger. Um, the, 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 the victim's son um, uh, was injured and uh, brought an action against uh, the driver and, uh, and also the insurer for the damages which he suffered. Right? Now, because the son was an infant, so the son, um, um, the, the case was settled at uh, 3.5 million. Uh, as the uh, amount awarded to the son. But because the son was an infant, so it requires court settlement, court approval of settlement, right? So when the court, when the master looked at uh, the case and found it that uh, uh, a portion, in fact, is 25% of the uh, settlement amount uh, would need to be paid to the solicitors, then the court raised a doubt whether this was trumpetous whether that was against maintenance and tranquility. So that's, that's why the matter was sent to criminal court and the court after trial convicted the solicitors for offending this common law, right? And then the matter took to the court appeal and court appeal uh, revealed the common law development of tranquility and maintenance. And then, um, so you can see um, uh, from th the fact that uh, uh, it um, so that um, uh, in essence, uh, what uh, the services fee was somewhat like a contingent fee basis, but um, slightly more than contingent fee because it sh he she also shared the proceeds of the result of litigation. And uh, what was held by the CFA was that uh, the scope of what constitutes maintenance and charity in Hong Kong has been narrow over the years and that reflects the change in public, public policy consideration. But even so, and then uh, the exceptions were stated. And then paragraph 177 to 179, it said, uh, it said that uh, 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 the question whether and to what extent criminal liability for maintenance should be retained in Hong Kong. And then in any, any of those, this was abolished, and also in Australia. But the issues are of some complexity and may involve taking a different view in the of maintenance as opposed to tranquility, and of criminal as opposed to tortious liability. And it is, in my view, a fit topic to be referred to the Law Reform Commission. Now, so you can see that, that uh, um, the law had um, confirmed or affirmed the common law uh, offense of tranquility and maintenance still applied to Hong Kong. But um, the court also said that because of change, of the um, social environment. This matter needs to be revisited and um, that should be a topic 
of Law Reform Commission. Now, I just pause here is that um, um, obviously in this case, the court found that uh, the contingent fee, or in this particular case, the sharing of the uh, process of litigation is against common law, right? So this system, this system of, uh, of contingent fee or system of uh, sharing of sale process or, or, or uh, sharing of process of litigation have been used in other jurisdictions. But still, the court, the CFA confirms that uh, that should still be applicable to Hong Kong. So that brings Hong Kong a different scenario from the other jurisdictions, right? So I mean, uh, we then look at uh, what um, the Air, uh, Law Reform Committee is doing. So what the, the Law Reform Committee is doing is that uh, uh, they, they confine or they reduce the scope of charity and maintenance and um, let this not applicable to arbitration. But they deliberately leave this matter still applicable in court, right? So for those matters which I refer you later, I, can, I have to clarify this, that those new provisions, they are only applicable to arbitration. For court, for example, civil court and, and criminal court, the contingent fee system is still, at the moment, against maintenance and charity. Okay. Now and then uh, we we I give you a timeline as to the third party funding for arbitration subcommittee. So that was set up uh, um, by the CJ and uh, uh, S for J, and uh, and then um, uh, the matters look at is now if the removal of charity and maintenance to arbitration proceedings in Hong Kong, there would be some benefits and the first one is of course the bringing more compet uh, bringing Hong Kong to a more competitive position and that is what um, uh, the LRC uh, consider because um, first of all Hong Kong is a renowned arbitration center and uh, uh, if we avoid to have this sort of legislation that, that means that our competitors and major competitors will, will, will take over our position. Now, um, just a matter of history is at that time, Singapore still maintains charity and maintenance, right? So um, that was the, at the time of LRC uh, when they produced the report. But after Hong Kong has um, um, enacted the, the, the amendment ordinance, uh, Singapore, as usual, they acted quickly. So in 2017, they also uh, changed their law. So uh, the charity and maintenance is no longer uh, applicable to arbitration proceedings. And in fact, in 2021, they would take things one step further. So uh, now in civil court, there is no charity and maintenance uh, in Singapore, right? So you can see uh, Singapore has acted very quickly. At, at the moment in Hong Kong, we only have this removal of charity and maintenance to arbitration proceedings only, but not to other uh, civil court uh, or criminal court. Okay, now, um, then um, we have the other uh, advantage of bringing uh, uh, more job opportunities to Hong Kong. Of course, uh, you, that's, you, you, that's understandable. Now next is that uh, uh, for the president judgment, because uh, CFA has got these two decisions, so the legislative uh, intent is to reserve those. So, so, um, so we are not changing the law by uh, reversing the judgment. We still uh, follow the judgment as I have just said. And uh, the, memory, the, uh, the the other point, the other advantage is, is that for those whose case uh, have merits, and uh, if we could allow third party funding arbitration, that would benefit them. So that is uh, another uh, advantage. And um, uh, last is uh, the LRC draw a distinction between arbitration and litigation. Now, because litigation is in the court and the court um, expenses are uh, from the community, from the government. So unlike arbitration, arbitration is a private agreement. So they, uh, they, are give, they should be given more freedom. So that is why uh, we think that uh, uh, the, if you look at why, the, why common law prohibits charity and maintenance, 
The reason is to reduce the number of litigations, reduce unnecessary litigations. But if we apply this theory to the commercial disputes, they themselves should be mature enough to look after them, especially in most arbitration cases involving company. So the commercial companies, they should be more watchful about their interests, right? So again, this is one of the uh, main distinguishing figure why uh, LLC at that time thought that uh, uh, those maintenance charities should be removed um, from the uh, arbitration um, industry. Okay, now then we look at um, the uh, legislation which was um, um, done by the uh, amendment ordinance and um, you can see that, that uh, um, that's by introducing so-called uh, Part 10A uh, in the in the amendment, and uh, uh, that would um, uh, took effect by um, the uh, saying that uh, common law offence uh, um, would of charity and maintenance would not apply to arbitration, and then uh, that was um, um, done, and then the court of practice. Uh, was also issued by the Secretary for Justice. And uh, you can see from this timeline. So starting from 1st of fe February 2019, everything is ready. So the legislature has been implemented, and then uh, the Secretary for Justice has issued the, uh, the, the call of practice. So, um, so you can see um, I've just extracted some of the um, uh, relevant provisions in the amendment ordinance to show uh, the purpose is to ensure that the third party funding is not prohibited by particular common law and then uh, it provides for measures and safeguard in relation to third party funding of arbitration. And then uh, 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 particular common law offenses do not apply uh, to, uh, for the case of arbitration and tort also does not apply. And more important is that uh, Secretary for Justice has issued a court or practice for third party funding of arbitration. Now, um, this topic has been discussed extensively in the uh, Law Reform Commission when they consult the public. I think the concern at that time was that uh, whether that would um, cause and um, uh, generate a lot of unnecessary dispute, uh, uh, um, even though um, we are talking about arbitration. Uh, so in order to um, provide some sort of safeguard to this, uh, we, uh, the Law Reform Commission had um, taken into account the other jurisdictions' experience. Now in UK, they, they do not have this sort of code of practice being done. Instead, they have, uh, they have their own trade union so that uh, they would uh, have uh, this trade union of investor. They, uh, the union had um, devised some sort of rules for the members to follow. Now in Hong Kong, we don't have this sort of, uh, uh, although we have some investor people, we don't have this sort of union. So it is uh, not realistic to provide a uh, union rules. So instead, uh, it was uh, resolved that uh, uh, Secretary for Justice would issue court of practice for providing some sort of guidance to third party funder and also the uh, party who, um, who, um, who will be um, uh, receiving those funds from the third party funder. Okay, now so you can, you can we, we really under, understand it that uh, if we talk about third party fund arbitration, it is essential that um, the third party funder and the funder party, they should have a, an effective and also a fair agreement so as to apportion the risk and uh, the profit which they obtain between them, okay? So that would be the um, uh, intention behind uh, for having uh, um, a, some sort of guidance or some sort of a control over the agreement between the third party funder and the funder party. So we now look at the core practice, you can see um, uh, although um, the, the core practice um, um, is, is a, well, I won't say voluminous documents, but uh, uh, this document contains a number of sections. But you can see, first of all, it starts off by saying who can be third party funders, the scope of court in order for this uh, core practice to cover, etc. 
and uh, conflict of interest, et cetera, et cetera. So um, you can see from, uh, from this code that uh, first of all, it defined who is the, uh, who, who is the third party funder. And, uh, um, and secondly is that uh, this code, code is to um, apply to funding agreement uh, commence or enter into after day of commencement of the code. And then um, uh, we can also see uh, 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 there is some sort of control on the promotion materials uh, uh, saying that uh, they should be clear and not misleading. And then uh, uh, defining um, what the essential elements of funding agreement. And um, the third party funder must take reasonable steps to ensure the fund party has received independent legal advice and have Hong Kong address for service, set out extensively the funding agreement and uh, the, the naming contract basis, etc. And then, um, um, now next is that uh, it is essential because the uh, third party funder who would be required under the, the agreement to provide fund. So it is essential to see that, that uh, they have sufficient capital to meet the requirement. So um, the, um, it's been, the amount has been discussed and uh, uh, now in Hong Kong, we've used the 20 billion as the, um, the capital, minimum requirement for capital. And also that uh, um, this um, has to maintain for a minimum period of 36 months. That's also important because otherwise, the money can be easily diverted away in order to avoid any uh, potential uh, disadvantageous situation. Okay, now not just the, the figures, but uh, also requiring audit opinion and also qualified third party to make sure that uh, this minimum capital requirements are met. And then um, um, the capital adequacy uh, would also require that the third party funder, if they have any change, usually adverse to their capital situation to notify the fund party so that uh, the fund party could decide whether to continue with the support um, or the so-called the third party funding agreement with the third party funder, right? So you can see, you can see that's for the protection of the, um, for, for, of the fund party. Now, next is about the conflict of interest. This is also important. Say, for example, if the third party funder and the fund party hold different view as to whether the proceeding should be continued or not, right? Now, that's also essential. And, 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 and there's also the possibility that uh, the third party funder may usurp his position, may usurp his, his influence and uh, reach a, uh, a settlement agreement or which the result which is disadvantages to the fund party because the uh, third party funder may have some hidden agenda with the party who will be sued by the fund party, right? So, so in order to manage the conflict of interest, uh, the uh, court or practice has provided some sort of um, a mechanism to this so that um, uh, you can see that um, uh, these matters have been set out effectively uh, as to how to uh, manage this sort of conflict of interest. Okay, so um, because of lack of time, so we, I don't think I could have sufficient time to, to go through this. But, um, um, but in, case, in case there is a dispute between the third party funder and funder party, uh, the, um, let me see. Sorry. Um, now, uh, that is something which I'm going to at um, a, a later section, if there is a dispute. But it also provided for the liability of adverse cause is that uh, this is also set out clearly in the third party funding agreement as to who should meet the liability for adverse cause and whether premium is required, etc. Right? So that would be um, essential uh, data required to be entered into the uh, third party funding agreement. And of course, I mean, the, um, there must be uh, some sort of provisions as to uh, how this agreement will be terminated. Of, of course, if the contract comes to an end, if the 
um, if the result comes to an end which is happy to both parties, then we do not need to resort to this grounds of termination. But uh, usually, this bill arises, especially during the course uh, of the um, of the cases, when evidence evolves and when more evidence uh, comes up, then originally the the parties may be optimistic about uh, the result of the uh, dispute resolution, but uh, later on. The evidence comes out and it shows that uh, uh, their case is a bad one. So how would this be dealt with? Then, then that would one of the way, of course, is to uh, for the third party funder to walk out from the termination agreement. So that would be uh, some sort of grounds where the uh, third party uh, funder could walk out from the uh, third party funding agreement. Okay, um, then um, 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 it important in section 2.14 is that the funding agreement must not establish a discretionary right for a third party funder to terminate the funding agreement in the absence of the services described in paragraph 2.13. So th that is some, some sort of restriction to the third party funder so that they could not uh, um, just say that uh, I don't like it, so I, I just walk out. So that, that can, cannot be the case. So they can only be walked out under this um, uh, grounds of termination in section 2.13. Okay, now then also the funding agreement should provide the funding party could also terminate the contract if they reasonably believe that the third party had committed a material breach of the court or the funding agreement. Okay, lastly, lastly on this one is the dispute regarding funding agreement. So if that there is a dispute between these two parties to the third party funding agreement, how would this be resolved? So uh, very likely that uh, there will be an arbitration within an arbitration, right? So that, that is a, a, a realistic situation and that happens in other jurisdictions. Okay, there is also campaign procedures. Uh, campaign in the sense that uh, uh, they could uh, uh, com com uh, campaign about those matters set out in section 2.18. Uh, this, this was provided by the uh, core practice and then uh, uh, the third party would also be required to uh, provide the um, reports to the advisory body. So th essentially the advisory body is still set up by the Department of Justice as to monitor and control uh, so that uh, we won't have uh, this sort of long sack entering into the um, third party funded industry. So that is something which um, um, uh, they are worried and uh, that is what they try to do is to have some control and in this case by annual reports, etc. Okay, and but um, more important is on the consequence of law and compliance. So uh, surprisingly, I mean for the consequence of law and compliance, uh, uh, um, it does not render any person liable to any judicial or other proceedings. So the court can only draw adverse inference or the arbitrary tribunal draw a any adverse inference uh, uh, to take a look that uh, they do not comply with the court practice. So, uh, so that, that is the, uh, what's been said uh, about the consequence of law and compliance. I mean, to me, that, that seems to be quite strange. And now we come to the conclusion. So in this case, um, the Hong Kong as a major arbitration center, and of course uh, uh, we, we, we try to uh, uh, unblock any possible block to uh, maintaining the competitive of Hong Kong as a major arbitration center. So this is what been done uh, by removing the Trinity, the common law of Trinity and maintenance in arbitration proceedings. And hopefully that could attract a, a number of investors to come to Hong Kong to uh, actually invest in those construction disputes. Now, in fact, uh, um, uh, my experience is that uh, some of the investors, they, they do have strong interest uh, in those um, uh, disputes, especially uh, for those disputes um, um, where the subcontractor, because they do not have sufficient money, they wish to uh, sue against the uh, main contractor. So um, uh, in, uh, th those cases, in fact, um, uh, uh, my experience is that uh, I have been um, uh, briefed to advise on the merits of those cases. 
and uh, to see whether this matter uh, should proceed or not. So uh, I, f I would think that um, uh, these cases would become more and more popular uh, in Hong Kong, and especially the, uh, in Greater Bay Area, we have a lot more, the more construction activities uh, being um, ongoing. So uh, these are matters which I think would uh, uh, bring more opportunity to, to uh, Hong Kong construction industry. So, um, so that is why I think uh, it would be more useful for you uh, to know more about this third party funding arrangement in Hong Kong. So um, probably that, that would uh, uh, be a convenient uh, moment for me to end my talk here because uh, I know that uh, I'm, I only f uh, I'm now at uh, 2.57. So, so um, that, that would be uh, the end of my discussion. Thank you, MT. Uh, please remain on stage for the Q&A. We have one question here. Is there any third party funding arrangement allowed in doing uh, arbitration in PRC of uh, Greater Bay Area? Yeah, I think that, that's a good question. In fact, uh, um, um, I've done some research and, uh, and also talked to some lawyers. Uh, essentially, in PLC, we don't have this sort of legislature, uh, just like uh, what I say, common law, uh, uh, forbidding uh, the um, charity and cham uh, charity and maintenance agreement. So the answer is that there is no such law or uh, or uh, legislation forbidding uh, the charity and maintenance agreement. Um, in in PLC, in fact, uh, before two thousand and sixteen, that was not common to have this sort of maintenance and charity uh, in in PLC. But uh, since two thousand and sixteen, it has now become more and more common. Uh, for for this matter, um, uh, because in fact, uh, uh, you you probably noted that uh, in PLC contingency fee contingency fee agreement is acceptable, right? So you uh, probably you have, if you look at the mainland film series, so you can see a lot of lawyers they are they are quite rich men because that they have a share of the process, but. Uh, but of course, in Hong Kong, we, we don't have. But uh, in, in, in PLC, because they have this, this sort of contingency fee arrangement, so that is why, that is why um, um, the requirement for this removal or maintenance and charity is not so uh, 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 imminent as like in Hong Kong. So, um, so that is um, my understanding. But uh, now, um, there are more and more cases on this um, uh, investment, third party funding investment in, 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 in PLC. In fact, uh, uh, signed from 2017, uh, these cases are, are, are rising very rapidly. Uh, I have a question actually, two questions. One, since the enactment of this or, or, uh, ordinance, has there been a rise in terms of third party participation funding? arbitration in Hong Kong, the number of cases. And the second one is, uh, the f you mentioned that the, the, the one of the annual report, the, the reason for submitting an annual report is to prevent loan sharks in, in, the, in the industry. Has that happened? Now, uh, uh, in answer to your first question, I think the answer is yes. The, there, there has been an in a steady increasing uh, number of cases where the third party uh, fund arbitration starts uh, 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 um, uh, to work here. And uh, regarding the uh, loan shark, uh, I think that would be something which the LLC is, uh, Law Reform Commission is worried about. Uh, at the moment, we, we, it, 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 I, have, I have not heard of, of this. Uh, so probably the, the mechanism as devised in the code of practice has uh, sufficiently safeguard against this. Well, due to lack of time, I think that will be the last question. Thank you, Mr. Young. Let us show our appreciation to our speakers.